Hey, thank you. Thank you, Professor Steve, for inviting me today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and a great opportunity to reflect on what is happening in Elaine, at least in a brief nutshell, in relation to non-invasive brain stimulation as a new technology. So as you see from the title, I will try to focus on cortical plasticity, which I've been interested for a number of years, ever since I was introduced to TMS in 1991. So I've been working with TMS from 1991. Um, I have uh, to master first the uh, pointer and everything that looks okay. So I have nothing to declare, um, um, but I find this analogy that I'm presenting down there very interesting because it's been uh, approximately 100 years since we first tried to use TMS to stimulate the brain until we developed an H coil, which is now widely used to treat different psychiatric conditions and other uh, disorders. So as I said, <laughs> during my talk, I will try to kind of build a case to point your attention to cortical plasticity and specifically how cortical plasticity may be an important tool in the disease of multiple sclerosis to counteract the deteriorating effects of the disease itself. And then more specifically, how we can use the RTMS either to probe the plasticity in order to develop an idea of what is happening uh, with the brain of the patient in order to eventually predict the, uh, the course of the disease as well as to potentially develop a personalized therapy. So to start, just a brief introduction about multiple sclerosis. I'm pretty sure everyone is more or less very much aware of what multiple sclerosis is, but nevertheless, uh, as you all know, it's a chronic uh, disease of the central nervous system, which is characterized by inflammatory, primarily demyelinating lesion of the brain and the spinal cord. Nevertheless, uh, I will try to draw your attention to other hidden aspects of the multiple sclerosis, and that is the involvement of the brain matter, which is of, of often gone, gone neglected. And this is where we are going to focus on cortical plasticity in particular. For the sake of the talk, uh, just a sentence about the course of the disease. As I said, it's a chronic disease and typically it presents as a relapsing remitting disease, which means that we have episodes of uh, acutely or subacutely developing clinical symptoms and neurological deterioration, which is followed by a successful full or partial recovery. Uh, another type of uh, multiple sclerosis, of course, is a primary or a secondary progressive where the simple symptoms involve in the absence of any relapse in between. The MS symptoms, of course, as uh, the disease it may affect any part of the central nervous system, may present basically with any focal neurological uh, deficits. But for today's talk in particular, I would like to emphasize the aspects of the neuropsychiatric and cognitive symptoms, uh, which included impression and um, cognitive impairment which is very much apparent in the multiple sclerosis, but as I said, often neglected. This is important because cognitive impairment often occurs very early in the disease, and it significantly affects the patient's quality of life and vocational status and the social activity. So it is very important to counteract these uh, symptoms. Now, how does the brain uh, addresses the issue of demyelination and loss of the gray matter or the changes in the gray matter? One of the main principles that is being developed and kind of shown in the animal studies is the function of the cortical plasticity. So when we talk about cortical plasticity, we are really focusing on the synaptic aspects uh, and we are more focusing on the mechanism of long-term potentiation, which is the enhancement of the synaptic transmission, which in our opinion has the potential to functionally compensate for the neural loss and <clears throat> Uh, augment the loss of excitability in the cortex associated with multiple sclerosis. So think of it like this. On one hand, we have demyelination. At the same time, there is a, a changes in the gray matter and there are changes in the uh, synaptic plasticity. And these changes in synaptic plasticity, just to make a link, are very much associated with the neuroinflammatory processes happening in the brain of MS patients. So. I would like you to, to think about these changes in synaptic plasticity as a form of synaptopathy. So diseased synapses, which are gradually, slowly losing their capacity to compensate. And once the physiological compensation is exhausted, the brain starts to deteriorate. So what I'm trying to build slowly for today's talk 
is basically an idea that we can use these new technologies, TMS being with us for approximately 35 years, to first of all, look into the brain, and secondly, potentially to use it to treat the brain in multiple sclerosis. I'm gonna jump on this slide because obviously it has been already shown repeatedly in today's lectures, the principle of action of TMS. So just for those who may have missed the initial part, it's the coil itself, which passes the high current through a specific winding, generating the magnetic field and the magnetic field producing a local electrical field in the cortex, as we heard very superficially, activating the large pyramidal neurons in the cortex, generating the action potentials through transsynaptic mechanisms. And eventually, if we are doing it over the motor cortex, producing a motor evoke potential, which is a very complex signal that we can analyze in different ways. But more importantly for today, apart from applying it as a single pulse, we can, and we heard that repeatedly again today, apply uh, TMS in a, in a, as a sequence of pulses, and we call that repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. The importance for my talk today is that you have to think that RTMS by inducing long-term changes, it basically can reflect on mechanism of cortical plasticity. And here you see the five basic protocols that I will be referring to today. Some of them using a, a, a traditional a high or low frequency, so low frequency and high frequency RTMS, and the so-called pattern stimulation uh, protocols, uh, RTMS protocols, which has been developed over the last few years, which use very powerful stimulation called theta burst stimulation to induce and probe into cortical plasticity. Finally, at the bottom of the slide, you see a paired associative stimulation, which is another RTMS type of protocol in which we are pairing the peripheral stimuli with the cortical stimuli. So the two stimuli are merging at the same time at the cortical level and inducing a specific plasticity. For the sake of understanding of what we're going to discuss today and reviewing some of the literature results that I will be presenting, I would like you to think of a continuous theta burst stimulation protocol, which obviously uses the bursts of high uh, 50 Hertz stimulation frequency as the protocol which is able to decrease cortical excitability, so it is often referred to as LTD-like uh, RTMS protocol. Unlike CTBS, ITBS, or inhibitory theta bar stimulation, uh, basically works opposite way. It actually increases, so I said the inhibitory, I should have said intermittent, it actually increases the excitability, so you can think of the ITMS as a LTP-like protocol. And finally, depending on the sequencing of the pulses, in other words, whether the peripheral pulse uh, arrives concomitantly and synchronously with the cortical pulse to the motor cortex, we can think of a uh, paired associated stimulation either as an LTP or LTD like uh, protocol, which obviously de uh, depends on the interstimulus interval that we are applying to the brain. So well, what is the actual idea here? If we have these RTMS protocols, we can then use them to probe into cortical plasticity and multiple sclerosis. And that's exactly what was initially done in one of the first reports that you see from Zeller, who followed in two elegant studies initially in 2010 and 2012, and explored the cortical plasticity using um, two protocols. Initially, he used an LTP-like protocol that you see up there. Again, this is the pointer, okay. Uh, so he initially used paired associative uh, protocol to probe into cortical plasticity in MS. The study was um, done on relatively small number of patients. So classical relapse, relapsing remitting patients, I think he used 22 uh, patients altogether. And if you look into the time scale after the, uh, the protocol was applied, so pre and post, you see almost no changes in cortical plasticity or at least no significant changes in cortical plasticity in MS patients. In a subsequent study, um, because this was testing the LTP protocol, um, Zeller applied the LTD-like protocol to, to which I already referred called continuous theta burst stimulation. And again, interestingly enough, there was no difference in cortical plasticity after the, so this is T0, T0 before the uh, um, CTBS protocol, there was no change in cortical plasticity after the application of the CTBS. So the initial conclusion from these two studies was that the rapid onset uh, somatic plasticity is not compromised 
in mild to moderately affected MS patients. Nevertheless, uh, in 2013, Moy came up with a very interesting study. So the question that they tried to ask was basically whether we can use cortical plasticity to probe uh, whether the synaptic changes, synaptic plasticity in MS patients correlates with the progression of MS. So they used a quite larger cohort of uh, patients, about 60 patients, and they used ITBS initially to induce LTP-like uh, changes, again, in a relapsing remitting patients. And what they showed that there is a clear difference between the relapsing remitting patients and the primary progressive patients. So in the above part of the, of the slide, you see the results showing the time after the ITBS. And this is the comparison of the motor evoked potential. So they were stimulating the motor cortex, which is basically a normalized value to the pre. And clearly you see that as compared with the primary progressive patients, the motor evoked potentials raised in the relapsing remitting patients. And the conclusion was very interesting and promising because it showed clearly that <sighs> In patients in which, which has a different uh, kind of course of disease, different disease progression, cortical plasticity is more preserved. So brain plasticity reserve seems to be correlating with the progression of the disease. And again, it is re-emphasizing of the idea that if we have preserved cortical plasticity, preserved LTP, that may kind of uh, affect the progression of the disease. In a subsequent study, later on, they used other protocols. And here, I just wanted to emphasize another important results because um, speakers before me were referring to uh, different uh, uh, approaches in which multi-parametric multi world is analyzed using artificial intelligence. So what Mori showed in his study is that platelet derived growth factor level correlates, and so this is coming from CSF itself, they correlate with the amount of LTP induced plasticity. Um, as you see here in this group of patients, and I just want to draw your attention to that, a CTBS protocol to which I was already referring it is inhibitory, and clearly you see here in healthy subjects that the MAP was decreasing after the application of CTBS was actually paradoxically increased in the MS patients uh, who had uh, a relapsing remitting disease. Mori followed up the, the study with uh, another uh, study in 2014. So there were two publications and here they, they, look, they asked a slightly different question. So they were focusing primarily on the prediction of the recovery in MS. And again, you see on the left hand side that mean map amplitude clearly cor correlated with uh, uh, the uh, recovery of the patient. So if the patient after the initial insult had a complete recovery, there was a higher mean motor work potential signifying higher cortical plasticity in these patients. Interestingly enough, and not totally surprising, just to draw your attention, they also pointed out that there is a negative correlation between age and completeness of recovery, in other words, um, all the patients will fare uh, poorer in terms in terms of recovery uh, uh, after the initial uh, impact of the disease. To move forward, in a subsequent study, uh, RTMS was used to test metaplasticity. And just for you who may not be fully aware what is metaplasticity, it's a protective mechanism that basically protects the synapse from being oversaturated after learning. So here the protocol was a combination of ITBS, which was preceded by the index finger. And the idea here is that the metaplasticity reverses the synaptic strength after the movement, resetting it and allowing new learning to happen. And the important uh, finding of this study was that MAPS were used in MS patients, again, 22 well, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe 24 MS patients were tested here uh, by Bayona. It's an Italian group in Milan. And uh, they showed that although the maps were reduced, the interesting and important thing is that there were clear changes both in plasticity and in metaplasticity. So two protocols were applied, one classical ITBS and another one preceded by an index finger. And you see there was actually no difference between two protocols. And this was an important finding because it showed us that in MS patients, the disease may also affect cortical plasticity as well as the mechanisms of the metaplasticity itself. 
Moving forward, this is the most recent study from 2022, uh, coming again from a uh, uh, mix of two groups from Balef. And here um, we use the slightly, or uh, they use the slightly different protocol, which is quadripass protocol. And in quadripass pro protocol, we don't use uh, uh, the uh, biphasic stimulation uh, uh, kind of profile. We use a monophasic one. And the importance of the quadriplast waterfall is that it is more stable in inducing cortical plasticity. And the importance of this study basically is that there were two significant parameters that were related with the overall performance of the MS patients. One is the measure of the information processing speed, and the other one measures the visual spatial short-term memory. And clearly, you see that, again, delta map, which is the difference between the uh, uh, map recorded before the stimulation and map recording after, clearly correlated. So the scores of these two parameters clearly correlated with, with the map itself. So what it showed us, again, is that we can use a very robust uh, protocol and demonstrate the, the preservation of the cortical plasticity in MS patients. There was clearly no difference between the two scores in healthy subjects. More importantly, even when we look into the cognitive impairment in MS patients, so linking it a little bit to today's conference related to mental health, and again, re-emphasizing the importance of cognitive impairment in MS patients, you see that here, um, the mean map uh, with, with quadripal stimulation uh, was, was, uh, was actually um, uh, higher in relapsing remitting patients and in, in healthy patients as well. So, the other important thing of this study is that those patients that had cognitively impaired, and this is what you see on the lower slide here, uh, so the patients which were uh, uh, less cognitively impaired had a higher uh, uh, had a higher higher map, so higher cognitive uh, cognitive sorry high, higher synaptic plasticity. So several studies now pointing towards the importance in the first place of the cortical plasticity in MS, more importantly emphasizing its importance and preservation for prediction and uh, <clears throat> development of the disease itself, as well as pointing out towards the cognitive impairment itself. Here I shift gear and here I just show our early attempt. So this is from 2017. We were uh, interested here to apply a different method. So here we applied a combination of the transcranial magnetic stimulation together with the EAG. So we were looking into the cortical response to TMS itself. The response is called TAPS. And as you see here, it has a very complex profile with the several uh, peaks and drops being identified uh, and their uh, actual relevance and origin is still uh, very much debated. But uh, most importantly here, what we were initially interested in is to see whether some of the modern therapies, disease modifying therapies used for MS can modulate the cortical plasticity in MS patients. And here you see that uh, patients uh, which were on fingolimod, which is one of the uh, classical uh, disease modifying drugs used nowadays, uh, there was a clear decrease in two important components of the uh, TEPS, transcranial evoked potential amplitude, uh, after, the, uh, uh, after the stimulation with another per, per, uh, per protocol, per TMS protocol called intracortical facilitation itself. Uh, what we are interested in at the moment is to follow up and pursue this study, and uh, here we are actually trying to follow longitudinal EMS patients and again use TEPS and other uh, RTMS protocols to probe into cortical plasticity and see how it evolves. And here I'm just on the lower panel showing preliminary results of the changes in TEP topography in several patients before and after uh, ITBS stimulation. And again, we see that that. Uh, these are the patients which are also treated with fingolimod. Uh, we see that, that there is an altered uh, topography of the ITBS related uh, TEPs in MS patients, signifying again changes in the cortical plasticity. Two more studies, and I'll speed up because I, the watch is looking into me and it's threatening because it shows 30 seconds only. So um, another study using the same paradigm, tms EEG from uh, Zipser, and uh, here they, they, they look into the same thing, basically. And the conclusion is that uh, although there are several changes, there is no conclusion about the significant changes in any of the 
a specific phase in the TEP response in MS patients at this point in time. Finally, again, shifting here and just introducing the potential of use of RTMS in treatment of cortical or modulation of cortical plasticity in MS patients. This is the, uh, this is the trend from 2022. It's a meta-analysis study. And here you see that the information is still rudimentary. We only have about eight articles which are discussing the issue, but there is a significant, as you see on the left-hand side, there is a significant uh, effect of uh, use of RTMS in treatment of cortical plasticity in MS patients. So to conclude, um, as I tried to tell you at the beginning, inflammatory changes in MS patients affects the synapse and affects the uh, synaptic plasticity. Um, I refer that, uh, to that as a synaptopathy. And uh, the importance of this is that it may negatively influence and negative and uh, uh, prevent compensation of and response to new demyelinating lesions in the and the neuronal loss in multiple sclerosis. So RTMS as a uh, cortical plasticity measure can actually be used to have some kind of a prognostication um, methodology to approach and be able to measure how the evolving uh, changes in cortical plasticity uh, in response to the therapy uh, happens in particular patients. So whether we apply it then RTMS alone and in combination with other therapies, we can also think of use of RTMS to treat some of the changes in cortical plasticity in MS patients. And uh, to conclude my talk for today, I just show you the slide of the newly introduced Abu Dhabi uh, Virtual Research Institute for Precision Medicine that is going to start hopefully this year. And some of the ideas that I just spoke about are going to be explored through different platforms. We will be looking into imaging, but also we will be using the big data analysis, omics, and other measurements to look into cortical plasticity in brain aging and in multiple sclerosis, as well as in other diseases uh, that are listed on the left-hand side. Thank you for the attention. And apologies for being over time.